Do you know that there was, there, like, there's icebergs, but did you know that there are lava bergs? Check out this Facebook video from G. Brad Lewis on a Hawaiian lava tour. It's a thing. Uh, look at that. That is a lava berg. Imagine if the Titanic hit something like that. Right? Jack would float on top of the lava. He wouldn't even need a door uh, to float on. But he'd be burning. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of Because Science Footnotes, the show where I take your comments, questions, and corrections from all the previous week's nerdery and address them here with the energy of a mildly caffeinated millennial. And I tell you what's coming up on the next episode of the main channel's show. Hint, it's small. It's tiny. It's so tiny. <clears throat> but first, on the last episode of Because Science, I was trying to figure out how cold Kratos' axe would really have to be if it could freeze enemies solid on contact. I said that using some basic thermodynamics, not even absolute zero would be cold enough for the axe to do what we see it do, and therefore, some magic is reasonable. Hey, Mariah, hey, what do you call a, a piccolo from Dragon Ball Z with a high body temperature? thermodynamic, because that's the name of the species, the green people. <sighs> I thought that was going to kill, but what did you have to say? Boop. Got you now. Our first comment comes from Ashley Ferguson, who says, is this a visual resume for Kyle getting into voice acting? Pretty impressed. Hashtag give Kyle a cameo on The Expanse. I love doing voices. I would love to do voice acting one day. I know it, it's not just doing voices. It's a, you, you have to be a good actor to be a good voice actor, which I am not. But I would love to try it because range, all the way from boy to <laughs> kind of like a meat wad. I'll try that. I don't want to go in there. No one would do it. And then in between, which of course is Yoda? <laughs> <laughs> what were we talking about? Oh yeah, also watch The Expanse and put me on it. Our second comment comes from a sad, strange little man who says, drinking game, take a shot every time you see the word boy, or boy, in the comment section, chugs bottle. Don't do that, you'll die. In the new Star Trek movies, there was a drinking game, take a shot every time that there's a lens flare. And using the first new Star Trek film, I calculated that, uh, based on the number of lens flares, which I counted them all in the film, if you were drinking every single time, men, on average, would die about 85 minutes into the film from alcohol poisoning, and women about 45 minutes into the film. I don't think there's as many boys in God of War, having played it, but don't do that. Please boy responsibly. Our next comment comes from Lucario LP, who says, when you called your Leviathan axe to you while explaining variables, it took 39 sec to reach you. You can't use K for seconds, but I really actually like it. Basically, it looks like it took 39 sec to reach you, assuming it flew at a re relatively constant velocity after takeoff, so it was about 300 feet away from me when I summoned the axe to my hand, which was over three times the current world record for throwing an ax at a target. Congratulations on your achievement. I love that. Great math. Thank you for that from Germany. In the game, you can summon your ax from almost any distance, and what the game designers did to make it feel weighty is not only did they add some rumble animation when your hands caught it, they actually removed some frames of the travel animation right before it got to your hand to make it uh, seem as though it was accelerating towards your hand, and it just like that. They actually remove frames to make it more impactful, which is I, I thought was a cool little bit of game design. And also, I can summon my axe from further than anyone's ever thrown an axe ever. Nice. 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 Range. Our next comment comes from Pryro Nick, who says, you said that you are in an emotionless void. It's true. But why can't, why can we see you? Shouldn't you be completely dark because you're surrounded by nothingness? There can't be anything that emits light from where the light comes from, or, or does it come from your beautiful hair and your hairy face that reflects it? There are a few light sources in the void, 
as I've come to understand it, but they're only present when they need to be present. And I'm never aware of that presentness. Because when, when you're in the void, it's kind of like a sensory deprivation chamber when you're not required to do something. Uh, your brain starts to create images and sounds. It's like hallucinating and your sense of self and what I is dissolves into the infinite nothing, nothingness that, that surrounds you. Also, hair oils. That helps. Thank you for asking. Our next comment comes from Panzer Grenadier Itsumi, nailed it, who says, if the axe is colder than absolute zero, how would, how would it react to the gas around like dioxygen or dihydrogen? I like that. And can it affect Kratos? Yes, if the ax was absolute zero, it would act to freeze or, or condense air around it to the point where things might condense out of it as liquid. What makes liquid nitrogen potentially so dangerous for all of the other reasons that you're probably familiar with is that liquid nitrogen is so dang cold that if you have a bowl of it, the air above the bowl, the oxygen will start to condense and become liquid oxygen near the bowl and near the uh, liquid nitrogen. And liquid oxygen is some of the scariest stuff on the planet. Because things need oxygen to undergo combustion and burning, giving uh, a material or an object liquid oxygen is like throwing hyperfuel on the fire, so to speak. It makes anything much more easily combustible. A liquid oxygen is so scary, well I've watched some military videos about it, it's scary, but liquid oxygen, don't look them up. Liquid oxygen is so scary in fact that the Mythbusters had a liquid oxygen myth that they did not go through with because they discovered it was way, way too dangerous to work with. So you're right, Pan, Panzer Grenadier Itsumi. The ax would be even more dangerous than you thought, but it, it, would, it would have to be kind of sitting out, not doing anything, condensing liquid. Our next comment comes from Brick Plaza Films, who says, someday I'll comment in time to get on footnotes. <sighs> that day was today. You blew it, you blew it. This was your chance, Brick! Our next comment comes from Jay Foley Perba, who says the Q formulas, the heat transfer formulas that I was using in the episode, uh, with the variables, it spells out the word Kalt, which is German for cold. So K, thermal conductivity, the area, cross-sectional area, the length across which the heat is transferring, and the temperature, the temperature gradient. Kalt, which is German for cold, which of course I thought of. I am a master of both mathematics and Germanic wordplay. Thank you for being one of the few who noticed my brilliant, intentional thing. But the nerdiest, but the nerdiest comment at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give to Donnie Morrow, who says, a lot. But basically, Donnie goes through uh, an alternative way that the axe could be super freezing and super cold and freeze enemies all the way through. Evaporative cooling using liquid cooling methods and lasers and quantum mechanics and a lot of cool stuff. He goes on to explain that evaporative cooling is why we cool down in the summertime. Your sweat takes some of the heat away with it, and when it evaporates, it's a much more efficient way of getting rid of heat from your body than just heat just radiating off of your skin. Donnie, this is actually something that I was toying around with as part of the explanation that I was gonna say, but as you point out, there's not enough volume in the Leviathan Axe to hold a bunch of evaporative liquid, or liquid you could use for cooling, so you said there'd probably need to be some magic involved, which is exactly what I thought as well, so Donnie, you are a super nerd. Ah! Ow, my hands. But of course, I'm not always right. I had literally no idea that Elizabeth Olsen was one of the Olsen sisters. Scarlet Witch? What? No idea. So I'm often wrong and misinformed and ignorant. So what, <laughs> so what, not in like the bad way. So what did I get wrong this week according to you? Our first correction comes from Matthew Hilliker, nice, who says, I would like to point out 
that the axe doesn't freeze someone solid, it encases them in ice. If it froze them solid, then they would shatter into pieces when you hit them once, but they unfreeze in the game and ice shatters off of them. Fair enough, I think it's hard to tell what's actually happening in the game. To me, it does look like both are happening, that they're freezing all the way through and that ice is forming around them. And to do the ice forming around them thing, you would need all the air around them to get cold enough that frost would form on the person. But if you want to create a layer of ice, you would need a, enough moisture in the air all going to the same source. And then that would be freezing, but then the axe would have to be pulling heat from all the way outside of the body. So, it's complicated. That's why I went with just the body. Although I think you are right in what we see, I don't think it would change the time or the conclusion that we're that we came to. It would take way too long, much longer than an instant, even if it was just freezing the air around someone. Our next comment comes from Albert Wesker, 1969, nice, who says, Nice video as always, Kyle. Trying to apply science and logical thought to ideas based on fantasy and fiction is a futile attempt but it's enlightening at the same time. You remind me of Wiley e. Coyote and the Roadrunner. You'd be the coyote trying to use science and logic to prove the Roadrunner and why I can't break the law of gravity. Unfortunately, just like the Roadrunner did to the coyote, he'd simply point out with the sign that he never studied the laws of gravity, hence his ability to break said law. Science and logic hit a brick wall <laughs> when it comes to the surreal and the imagination where everything is possible and all laws and nature go out the window. Biologists have clocked greater Roadrunners at around 32 kilometers per hour, and they've clocked coyotes, wily or not, at around 69 kilometers per hour. Nice. Which means that the coyote could catch that roadrunner. And science could catch magic and explain it. Wesker, if that is your real name, it's not. Our next correction comes from Ulbeck, who says, the magic is obviously not to have a colder than zero Kelvin axe. The magic would be to increase the heat transfer rate. This would also help the problem of thermal conduction through the frozen flesh. Seems you went in the entirely wrong direction with this analysis. Okay, fine. That's, that's fair, fair reasoning. I was more comfortable using the thermal conductivity, K in our equation, of human flesh, because then we wouldn't have to make too many assumptions about what a drogger is actually made out of and what temperature it's at. This is uh, parsimony, trying to make the least amount of assumptions possible. What's the most likely version of this that we can try to science? You're right, if we did change the thermal conductivity of a Draugr's flesh, let's say we change it to something like the thermal conductivity of copper, pure copper, which is like a hundred times more conductive, then to freeze just a centimeter of flesh like we were doing in the episode, it would take around a third of a second. So your instincts are absolutely right, but you'd still have to freeze a whole body, which would be many seconds, therefore, and it's still not instantaneous like we see in the game. Again, I think we are safer using assumptions and values that are closer to known values. Sure, we can say that Draugr flesh just has copper conductivity, but based on what? So we're always trying to build a, a chain of reasoning that's, that's somewhat solid on every step so that your foot doesn't break through the floor. Our next correction comes from Lord Bakhtor and Zafra D who say, wouldn't freezing a corpse boy, thank you, that that fast also create an explosion like with Iceman, that heat has to go somewhere, right? Well, in a very early episode of Because Science, I said that Iceman is actually like a bomb. To remove all of his heat instantaneously from his body and become ice from human flesh temp, all of that heat would have to go somewhere. And because we don't really see where that heat would go, it would have to emanate from his body very quickly and violently, which would make Iceman kind of like a bomb whenever he transformed. Now, I see where you're going with this, with Kratos in the ax and freezing a Draugr or another troll or something. But that heat has somewhere to go. As we were analyzing it, I was thinking of the heat going from the head of the ax to through heat flow through the ax and maybe into Kratos, maybe to fuel the flames of his Spartan rage. I think this example isn't quite like the Iceman problem because the heat has somewhere to go. They can go through the axe and into Kratos, and because we know that he has a lot of pent-up flame rage, maybe that's where it's going. Iceman has a different problem. It would just have to... Ah! Ah! 
kind of counterintuitive, but that's why I like it. But the nerdiest correction at the time I'm filming this episode, I gotta give to Ninja Jake 21, who has a profile picture that's not just playing off the popularity of the streamer Ninja, which I appreciate, who says, great video, Kyle, but I think you made a bit of a wrong assumption. Droggers are dead boys, right? So why compare their body temperature to a live boys? I, I bet they have a lower body temperature, and I think that if you took the temperature of a corpse, you'd have a closer approximation. Corpses, due to death chill, Al Gore Mortis, lose heat at about 0.83 degrees Celsius each hour until they reach room temp, and droggers or corpses, corpses of dead dudes reanimate it, right? So depending on where the drogger came from and how long it's been out in the place that you're in, its body temperature will vary. So if a drogger came from a northern area and it was chilling out in a frozen wasteland waiting to fight Kratos, his or her body temperature may, are, might already be below freezing. I bet our frost axe could freeze them through then. A couple of commenters pointed out that Draugr would probably be colder than we are assuming, normal human flesh temp, because they're in icy areas and they're dead. But it doesn't really make a whole lot of a difference. The difference between freezing temperatures and body temperatures is about 37 Kelvin. Not a whole lot. We're talking about temperature differences, when uh, temperature gradients, we're talking about absolute zero of 310 Kelvin. So just 10% or so difference. But I like where your head's at. Other commenters mentioned this, but you gave me the actual stats for how a corpse would get colder over time. So for that reason, Ninja Jake 21, you are indeed a super nerd. <laughs> Oh, every time. Now, if you are subscribed to Alpha at projectalpha.com, you already know what the next episode of Because Science is going to be because you have already seen it. Lucky you. And if you sign up, you can also get other shows that I'm in. But if you haven't signed up for Alpha just yet, the next episode of Because Science is why Ant-Man is the most powerful Avenger. Maybe. <laughs> That's right, in this week's episode of Because Science, I am trying to explain why I think Scott Lang may in fact be the most powerful Avenger, because if he truly had the powers of the quantum realm, he could do stuff that would be absolutely Ah! And might be the key to saving the future of the MCU. Maybe. The Void has already manifested part of this video for me, and I can tell you, it is truly mind-blowing. So you're gonna wanna see it, and then reevaluate your position in the universe. So go watch the latest episode if you haven't yet, and send me all your comments, questions, and corrections at youtube.com slash because science, facebook.com slash because science, and at because science on Instagram and Twitter. That's where I'll be pulling stuff for this show. So get in early and get nerdy. Also, happy birthday, Michael. <laughs> and don't forget, when you hold a shell up to your ear on the beach to hear the ocean, you're probably just hearing your own body pulsating and vibrating as the void of air that is inside of the shell acts to amplify the vibrations of your body that you're putting the shell up against. So you're not hearing the ocean, you're hearing the gurgling of self which I like even more. Hey, it's kind of nice. It's like an ocean. No, that's your guts in your brain. <laughs>